it is who to email if you have if you're having problems. Quick uh, note about who we are. Uh, well, my name's Susan Gallo. I'm the executive director of Maine Lakes. Uh, Maine Lakes. We used to be Maine Lakes Society. We were also Maine Cola. We've, uh, but now we're changing our name to Maine Lakes. We are a statewide lake conservation organization. Lake Smart, as I mentioned, Brooke is our program manager for that. That's our flagship program. We do a lot of work with lake associations. Lakes Alive is our outdoor programming. Uh, arm and then we do a lot of advocacy mostly in Augusta but sometimes in uh, Washington DC. So it's a quick, we don't have much time to talk about ourselves. Uh, I will just jump to our, introduce our speakers. Uh, just a quick note before I do that, that at the end, um, well first of all we have, we had designated 45 minutes for this webinar. We're very grateful that our speakers have uh, agreed to stay on for up till, till five o'clock. So we have a little bit more time. The webinar will be, will be recorded and we'll be emailing it out to everybody after. If you can't stay on with us till five, you can catch up the end, with the end of the uh, webinar by recording. There's also, uh, when we finish, there'll be, uh, you'll be directed to an option to take a quick survey. It's just five questions, shouldn't take more than a minute. We'd love to hear back from you about the webinar and, um, and what you think. And if you like it and you would like to join more, please visit our website and we'd love to have you join us as a member. So I think I've covered everything pretty quickly. I will jump to our speakers. We have three very generous panel, panelists who, have, joined, who um, have, have stepped up to join us today. Uh, I'll introduce all three and then um, turn it over to them. So Tracy Hart is the first speaker. She uh, joined Maine Audubon as a wildlife ecologist and director of the Maine Loon Project in 2019. She brings out, brought over two decades of experience in wildlife conservation and, and environmental education. She's worked as a conservation specialist at nonprofit organizations throughout the U.S. and abroad, and she spent a number of years working as a federal biologist and in marine outreach. So she's gonna talk from the Maine Audubon perspective, give us some information about the population and where it's headed in Maine. Mark Pokris is our second panelist. He is a fantastic wildlife vet, known and loved by all of the loon biologists and the <laughs> loon uh, conservationists around the world, I would say. Mark has spent three decades at Tufts Wildlife Clinic, uh, where he served as a director and also the co-founder of the Tufts Center for Con Conservation Medicine. He retired, luckily for us, he retired to Maine in 2015. He studied Luden since the 1980s, and he currently consults, lectures, and writes on a variety of environmental health and conservation topics. And then our third panelist is Jim Peruk. Jim is an associate professor in the biology department at St. Joseph's College. He's been studying loons since 1993 and has published over 25 scientific manuscripts on loon behavior, migration, and winter ecology. For the last 15 years, much of his research has focused on win their winter ecology. And he's also studied loons in the Gulf uh, uh, after the Deepwater Horizon spill. So I should back up and say, Mark's gonna talk to us a little bit about loon health issues. Uh, and then Jim is going to talk about uh, something we don't hear, uh, a topic we don't hear a lot about, which is winter ecology. So with that, I'll pass it over to Tracy. I'm going to okay. stop. I will yeah, share my screen. Let's see here. One minute. And, and Mark and Jim, if you don't want to be on screen, you can... Uh, in the top right, you can hide yourself if you want, or you can stay stay on as a pretty as pretty faces while Tracy talks. <laughs> Oops, this is actually okay. All right, can everybody see it? See yep. my okay, great. All right, well, thank you, Susan, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. So, as Susan said, I'm Tracy Hart, and I work at Maine Audubon. I've been on staff for about a year and um, currently managing the Maine Loon Project. So I've been asked to come on to talk about some of the work that Maine Audubon is doing um, related to loons and then touch on a little bit of how climate change uh, it may be affecting loons. So um, 
Uh, yeah, so the first thing that you may have heard of is one of our signature programs, the Maine Annual Loon Count. And uh, a poll has just popped up for Maine Lakes that um, asks you if you've been involved in a loon monitoring program. So this is Maine's version of it. And it's a half hour snapshot. Uh, right now we have over 1300 volunteers who go out on lakes throughout Maine and count loons. It's on the same day each year, same time. So it's on the third Saturday of July from 7 to 7.30. And what this count does, it is allows us to derive a population estimate for the southern half of Maine. Um, and not the northern half currently because we just don't have enough coverage, but you can help change that uh, by signing up for the loon count. We're always looking for more counters, both on southern and northern lakes. So please you know, email us or call us at that contact information. And I'll have more contact information at the end too. Okay. And now we'll find out from the poll results how, how many of you have participated in loon monitoring. Um, so this is the results of the loon count. Oops, I can't actually see my own graph, <laughs> the poll there, but that's okay. Um, uh, there we go, that's good, people can see the graph, thanks. Um, so this is the results, the loon count has been going on for 36 years and um, the yellow line right there is the trajectory for the population of adult loons and in the southern half of the state. And the red is chicks. Um, so you can see a clear trend that loon populations have been increasing over, these, over the last decades. Um, so good news. And some of the things that we attribute to that increase is one, the no wake law in Maine, which if you are a boat operator, you're required to keep speeds that are below, um, uh, below speeds to create wake if you're within 200 feet of shore. And so that's been really instrumental in keeping loon nests from being flooded. Uh, loon ta uh, lead tackle legislation has also been key to getting lead out of Maine's lakes. So currently uh, sinkers and lead-headed jigs are banned for use and sale if they're under an ounce or measuring two and a half inches or less. Um, and then last thing is the loon counters and community actions themselves. So programs like Lake Smart and loon counters, anything that is engaging citizens to get out and, um, and prevent disturbance and habitat loss of loons. So, yeah, so, so the, and then we'll see where things go as, as various things change. Um, Brooke is gonna be covering the lead a lot in a lot more detail on May 13th if you can join the effects of lead on loons but I just wanted to quickly mention the Maine lead tackle buyback program. So this is something that Maine Audubon is partnering with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife um, and both Mark and Susan have helped on this project as well um, but we're piloting the program with these participating retailers on the screen and any anglers who turn in an ounce of lead tackle or more can get a $10 voucher um, to buy lead-free tackle. So, we're, so I hope you can help us get the word out. And if you wanna learn more, there's a, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, but there's a website right down here at the, the bottom for learning more. Um, okay, and climate change. So that's to talk a little bit about climate change. Maine Audubon has been serving on um, a committee and a subcommittee of the Maine Climate Council. And so we're providing input on the effects of climate change to wildlife. So this was one slide that was presented to the Climate Council recently, and it's on the, some of the current and predicted effects of climate change on loons. Um, so loons are vulnerable to excessive heat. They can, um, they've, it's been shown that nesting success is lower with higher temperatures and they can leave their nests leaving eggs vulnerable to predators and to overheating. Um, more biting insects, so this, this, they're miserable just like we are with lots of black flies. And last summer we did hear from a lot of loon counters that early in the season loons were leaving their nests because of black flies. So, um, Mark's going to be talking more about new parasites and diseases and um, prey changes can also be something that can be related to climate change, both in terms of new species coming in and changes in current prey populations as temperatures change. Um, okay, and uh, other 
effects of climate change include extreme storm events. Loons nest right on the water's edge. And so fluctuating lake levels can have an impact on flooding nests and washing eggs out of nests. Uh, loons are also visual predators. So the water quality changes that come with rising temperatures can uh, affect loons' ability to capture prey. Um, they habitat changes because they're right on the shoreline. They're also important. And then loons are really, uh, their migration is timed really closely with lake freezing and lake thawing. So all of these are challenges, new challenges that are facing loons. Um, this is um, a picture, I'll just sort of wrap it up and show what some of those challenges might look like um, for loon distribution. This is a, a model that was created by National Audubon and it's showing what the predictions are for 2080 uh, if we keep on the current climate path. And uh, you can see the yellow is the summer, ex predicted summer range for loons and the blue is predicted winter range. And so the thing to note, the, there are no loons breeding, predicted to be breeding in Maine if we stay on our current path. Um, so, but the good news to all that is that there is a lot we can do to change course. And um, there are things both at the state level and then you personally, what you can do. So the first thing I'd say is to learn more. This is, a picture over here of Maine Audubon's new renewable energy and wildlife report. And so this is emphasizing the importance of renewable energy and also um, some of the impacts that can happen if we don't pay attention to citing these, ener these uh, renewable energy programs well. You can also get involved in community science and we have, there's a program called Science of the Seasons run by Cooperative Extension and Maine Audubon is partnering on that. And this is an opportunity for um, citizen scientists to start looking at and tracking some of the impacts to indicator species like loons from climate change. And the last thing is taking actions to reduce your carbon emissions. Uh, this is a, the Drawdown Eco Challenge was something that I learned about at a conference recently and it's just some fun and measurable ways to reduce your own uh, carbon emissions. So that's all I have. I can turn it over now to Jim or Susan. And thanks so much. Thank you, Tracy, so so much. I know we're packing a lot into um, just to back up and let people know we're giving each uh, each panelist about eight minutes to do their presentation. We are hoping uh, that'll be all wrapped up by about 4:35, and that'll leave us. Um, 25 minutes for questions and some we've got some questions on the board here we have some that you submitted before but just as you think of questions submit them and we'll do all the questions at the end like I said Brooke is organizing those and prioritizing those um, but right now we'll hand it over to Mark now did you want okay. did you want me to do your slides here well let me try it and if I mess yes. it up then you can you can take over let's see okay. what I can get to here <laughs> Um, there we go. Oh. Can you see it? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Good. Okay. Well, what I want to do, um, oh, is, you just have to <laughs> sorry, sorry, you just, I think you want to slot, start your slideshow like you would on, uh, gotcha. Yep. yep. Perfect. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. So can everybody see now? Yes. Well, actually, now we, well, that'll work. That'll work. What would you like better? Well, we see your pre, it's sort of in preview mode, so we can see the next one that's coming. Oh. But that's okay. Let's see. I don't know how to get out of it, so. Yeah, I'm not, well, let's leave it this way so we don't waste too sure. much. Time. So good. anyway, what I want to do today is really talk a little bit about some of the long-term um, studies we've been doing on loon health and some of the ways to get involved should you find loons in trouble. Um, and I think, you know, this will complement some of what Tracy was talking about and some of what Jim will talk about. You know, ideally, as we enjoy loons around our lakes, they don't get into trouble. They migrate in, they 
have a nest, they raise their young and they migrate back out in the fall. But periodically, <clears throat> unfortunately, things do happen and people want to get involved in trying to help loons. Well, this is, you can tell with the first picture, this is a, an ocean beach rather than a lake beach. But uh, here's a woman, this is ginger gum in California, actually, um, with a loon that she's encountered on the beach. And, you know, should you be in a situation like this, you'll notice a couple of things. From the loon's point of view, it's got a really sharp beak. <laughs> um, you want to be very careful about that because that can do quite a bit of damage. And if you look at the, the woman here, if you look at Ginger, she really isn't equipped to do a loon rescue at this point. She doesn't have any protective gear. She doesn't have gloves. She doesn't have something to put the loon in. And so this is not an ideal situation. And I think one of the things that we want to get across to people is oftentimes if you run across a bird that is in trouble, what you probably need to do is you need to seek help because these are animals that because of their big strong birds and they've got a really sharp beak and they can do damage if they get scared and angry. Um, and so certainly here in Maine, we have a Maine warden service that is very responsive to this sort of thing. We have uh, wildlife rehabilitation groups scattered around the state of Maine, many of whom can respond and help out with uh, these sorts of things. And the wildlife rehabilitators are um, listed on the Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife site and are in the process of forming a state wildlife rehabilitators association at the moment. And then of course we have um, a Maine Audubon Society that you can always call and Tracy can probably give you some more information about that, but they can provide information about local groups that can help you if you should run into a situation like this. So let's talk a little bit about how loons get into trouble and some of the things that we've learned about this. I'm glad that uh, in a couple of weeks, Brooke is gonna be doing a more in-depth talk because this slide sort of summarizes a lot of the problems that we see in the summer with loons on lakes. And that is that most of the problems that loons run into are caused directly or indirectly by people. Uh, it's not to say that loons don't injure one another periodically. They get into territorial fights that can be quite serious and they can be injured by predators periodically. But an awful lot of what we see is due to human interactions and, and much of it is in this slide. They ingest fishing gear, they get tangled in fishing line, they get hit by boats. Um, mostly not because people mean any harm, but oftentimes I think because people don't know any better. Back to the rescue issue at this point. So if you, if you were to find a loon in trouble, here's some rescue sort of pictures. On the left is uh, Nina Schock, who runs a loon program in the Adirondacks in New York, doing a winter rescue. And, and those of you with good eyes will note that that's a red-throated loon, not a common loon. Um, but you'll notice that she's holding it carefully under the body, but she's got the head immobilized, so that beak isn't going to strike out and do any harm. The middle picture shows a, a loon in a nice big plastic tub, um, because they'll often peck their way out of cardboard boxes, unless it's a short trip. And you'll notice that they put a lot of padding underneath that loon for transport, and that can be important too, so they don't, loons don't injure themselves. And then you'll want to make it dark. You'll want to put the the top on or something to keep the bird relatively quiet. Mark, I'll just, 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 I'll just interject that Please. for anybody, just to make sure that everybody knows uh, before you even go down the road of handling that you, anybody in Maine has to contact a rehabber or the state before you even consider touching or picking up a loon. I just want to make sure people know that we're not advocating for people to go Pick them no, up. We, we are not. We are you're not advocating. You're I, giving I think, good advice for people when they have permission to, to move ahead. I think, I think every once in a while, and it always happens on weekends and evenings and things like that, people find injured animals and they right. can't reach somebody online or on the phone. Yep. And then they sometimes want to try and do something themselves out of the goodness of their heart. Absolutely. So this but is a great. No, this is, yeah, this is great. Started, first slide, you've really got to be prepared to do this. and You want to be very careful. It's better yep. not to try it if you're not set up to do it. It's better to seek expert help. Yep. Yep. Good. Sorry. I just wanted to... No, that, that's absolutely important. 
Um, and so here's a field rescue of a loon. And you notice that it takes a couple of people to hold one comfortably and covering its head. And this is a bird that was entangled in fishing line, which we see fairly frequently. Um, and again, just note that big powerful beak, that can, that can hurt. We often see animals that not only um, get tangled in fishing line, but have fishing gear associated with it. We'll come back and talk about that. Many of these animals can be helped, but not all of them. Sometimes birds will, whoops, where'd that last picture? Yeah, sometimes birds will crash land, um, on, particularly on wet asphalt highways, or sometimes they'll be injured by boat hits or predators or something of that nature, sometimes even gunshot. And it's important to get these to rehabilitators so that they can be evaluated for help. If, you're, if they're going to a rehabilitator, again, they have to be immobilized correctly. That beak is dangerous. You'll notice in the right-hand picture that the woman there has a heavy coat on to protect herself against pecs, and she's also got eye protection, which is very important. Once the animal's immobilized, it can be evaluated, and this is um, Olivia, a, a veterinary student. There's a, a bird on the x-ray table there, and you can see it's been x-rayed, and she's doing some blood work on it. And then when we get the x-ray, uh, unfortunately, we see a fair number of animals that swallow fishing gear and can get in trouble either because of the, the hooks or the lead weights. And I think Brooke will be talking more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but when you get them to a rehabilitator and the rehabilitators are working with veterinarians, oftentimes they can help. They can anesthetize the animal. They can do endoscopy or other procedures to get lead gear out. Um, we can take blood samples to check and make sure that the animals are healthy. There's a lot we can do to try and assist these animals. But I, I do want to emphasize that every time we encounter a loon, it's important to not only help that animal, but to get the information from, that we can from that animal to learn more about the environment. You know, when we take a blood sample from a loon, we can measure it, uh, measure um, pollutants in it. We can measure lead, we can measure mercury, we can measure other chemicals. Um, as as um, Tracy said earlier, we can look for infectious diseases, particularly things like avian malaria that are associated with climate change. But sometimes when people are out around lakes and the shore, they'll encounter loons that haven't made it, that are dead. Um, and even then, these animals can be very important to study. Um, you can see that that particular bird was banded which means that it's been captured before. So it's particularly important to know what happened to that bird, but even after they're dead, um, you know, many of you have seen, um, you know, forensic programs on television, uh, CSI and things of that nature. And you can tell a lot about what's going on out in the environment from looking at dead animals. And that's one thing that, <laughs> that we do a fair amount of. I do some, um, and uh, Brooke, Hafford McDonald has done quite a few. And here we are in the lab. Um, that's me in the green and Brooke in the black. And in between us is Danielle Doria, who's a biologist with the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, IFMW here in Maine. Um, and so even if a loon doesn't make it, it's important for us to look at it and try and figure out what's going on, both to understand threats to the loon and understand more about what's going on out in the environment. So in a couple of weeks, Brooke will be talking a whole lot more about some of the things that she's learned from her field work and her work in the laboratory as well. Of course, you don't want the birds to end up dead. The, the, best, um, the best end point in a situation where you find a loon is you find it alive and you get it to a rehabilitator. And after some days or weeks, um, it's better and they're able to take it back out on the, the lake and, and uh, release it. And many of these birds that get released do quite well. Um, ideally, they're banded at release so that we can follow them for extended periods of time and see where they go and whether they breed again. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful series of studies. And I think this opportunity to have field biologists working together with citizen scientists, loon counters, veterinarians, wildlife rehabilitators, regulatory agencies, it's a particularly strong approach to both understanding loons and protecting the birds and the environments that they live in. And I think that's the end. 
That's awesome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll jump right over to Jim. Jim, uh, you're gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna try to share my screen and right. see how that works. Um, no. Let's see if I can just get it. Uh, Does that work? Um, okay. that oh, that's, is, good. that's it. All right, let's see how I do. So hello, everybody. Um, welcome. It's, uh, it's awesome that so many folks are here. Uh, we're here to talk about loons, which is a great diversion from everything that we've been dealing with. So uh, grateful for Susan for reaching out to do this. Uh, and I get to talk about winter loons, which is something that I've been passionate about for the past 10 or 15 years. So I'm just going to give an overview. I'm gonna kind of move through this a little quickly. I'm gonna present some data and just give you some, some general knowledge on winter behavior uh, and ecology of loons. We love loons and their breeding plumage, black and white bold patterns. They're striking, we love them. You know, they vocalize. However, in the winter time, they're very dull. They molt, but they molt their feathers. Uh, they rarely vocalize. They're oftentimes overlooked and you could be walking along the beach and not even be aware that there's loons present. So loons migrate uh, primarily uh, the fish that they like to feed on is covered underneath a foot or more of ice and so loons migrate predominantly to marine waters. Probably 93-95% uh, of all the loons wintering in uh, marine environments. Some will use freshwater reservoirs to spend the winter as well both in the southwest and in the southeast. So we're mostly focusing on loons here that are in New England. So I'm just going to kind of lead us through that. This was a study that a Wisconsin researcher did back in, uh, you know, over 10 years ago. But when you look at the patterns for like the loons in Maine, this is like the Rangeley Lakes area, Lake Umbagog, we see that the loons spent their winter all along from like, you know, Bar Harbor down to Southern Maine. And then these were loons that were set, satellite transmitters were put into them from New York. And you can see they were kind of north of Cape Cod down into Long Island and off the coast of New Jersey. So there's almost like a settling pattern that the loons that are closer to the coast kind of wintering up here and then loons further in New York or of course are a little further south, maybe Cape Cod area for example. Now these are some data, this was a project I worked on, uh, you know, you can see probably seven, eight years ago. Uh, I know some folks are from outside of the area, but this is, you know, northern Maine. These are three lakes up in northern Maine. And we were able to catch these loons and put satellite transmitters in them. And we were interested in finding out where these birds spent the winter. Now, the one thing that's pretty unique about this is the ones that I kind of circled here previously. From this lake, this was the exact pair that was together. So on Aziskahas Lake, that was the male and female. They were the same pair. And what you notice is the winter is the male spent the entire winter, you know, off the coast of, you know, Bar Harbor, northern Maine. And the female was south in Nantucket Sound, south of Cape Cod. Another thing that was noteworthy is we caught another pair on this lake, Flagstaff Lake. Uh, this were not the same pair, but uh, loons that nested on the lake. And you see the male again spent the entire winter off the coast of Maine. And the female was down here off Chincoteague Bay, down in Maryland. So this bird separated. So we start to see a little pattern. Males seem to migrate perhaps not as far south. Uh, and females perhaps a little more. Obviously, as a scientist, I'd like to see more sample size to see if, if there is some kind of trend here. Uh, but it is interesting to see that these birds kind of spatially set them, separating themselves out between males and females. Now, a second part of the study was wondering, do these birds go back to the same location year after year? So we're asking, do they exhibit winter site fidelity? We know that loons on breeding lakes typically tend to respond and return to those lakes 80, 80 to 90 percent of the time. So what's it like in the winter time? So again, we would put bands on and try to watch them, but this was using satellite transmitters. And this is just showing you the dark color was one year, and this was the territory that the birds used, and then the light color was where they were the following year. And you can see there's tremendous overlap in the range of the winter range of these loons, and also they showed winter site fidelity. Now I was been, I've kind of banded somewhere over 150 loons in the winter time, and uh, from some of the subset of data, we see about 80% winter site fidelity. 
So in other words, loons go back to the same area year after year, spending the winter, just like they do in the summer. Now in 2004, this is off the coast of California in Morro Bay. I had a graduate student at the time, Darwin Long, help me. Uh, he was leading this project and we're studying the winter ecology of loons in, in Cal off the coast of California. And this bird, you can see the bands here, this bird is 16 years has returned to the same wintering area. So for 16 year winters, which is uh, you know, kind of a record for us. And we're excited to see that this bird is still doing well and still returning after all these years. I'll be very brief. How do we catch loons in the winter time? It's a little tougher than in the summer. Uh, in the summertime, they have chicks and parents uh, protect them and they tend to want to stay up near the chicks and it's easier to catch them. In the winter time, there's no chicks, so the adults have nothing to defend. So when you approach them in a boat, they mostly just dive. And it's kind of hit or miss. And what really helps is you can see this long handle on this net. Now that's when you're really reaching out over the boat. I usually have someone holding on to me. So if I go too far, I haven't fallen in yet. And we try to scoop the loon in. So this is kind of our technique. And uh, this is now implanting satellite transmitter inside the bird. So we hire a DVM who has experience working with loons. Uh, this is a Salomic implant. And just to see what that looks like, here's the antenna that sticks out from this loon. This was uh, caught in Louisiana. So this was a bird in 2011. So there's the satellite transmitter. This antenna sticks out. And if you're wondering about the, like, the elasticity of it, it's very flexible. It's very loose. Uh, it doesn't seem to impede the bird. Now this bird migrated over 2,000 miles and still came back to the same location the following year. So I felt it had little uh, effect on its overall health. Now going back to loons here in Maine, you know, water temperatures might be 36 to 42 degrees in the month of January, air temperatures, the lows and the highs 13 to 31 Fahrenheit. And a question that I would ask, I'm sure in curious minds, like are these loons cold? We know water conducts heat 25 to 30 times faster than air. So, this loon looks like a fairly small bird, yet it's in really a cold, cooling environment. And so you kind of wonder, like, uh, are they stressed? Uh, a little bit from what I can tell is they seem completely comfortable. Uh, I've seen loons foraging really cold temperatures. Uh, they seem to be fine. I, uh, for this, they have similar feather arrangement as emperor penguins. They kind of have a dense inner coat of feathers uh, that are very zipped, very tight. And as long as that's not impeded in any way, uh, this bird is going to be comfortable. And one of the concerns about oil spills in the ocean, where that, in that oil interrupts with that zipping layer uh, for the birds. Uh, and then they can die of hypothermia. Now loons molt their flight feathers in the winter. So this bird looks very odd. The primaries are gone. The secondaries are just being replaced. Uh, this is probably energetically expensive for a loon. Uh, and it's a, good, it's a good thing it's in a uh, safe place where there's lots of food to help give them nutrients in order to support this new feather growth. Now I showed this to you, this is a loon here. I want you to notice something on this bird. This is an adult bird. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show this to you. You notice how it's, you have square edges to these feathers. So these squares tell us it's an adult bird. Uh, typically has a little darker collar here and a darker bill. Now I'm going to show you a picture of a two-year-old bird and you'll notice that this bird, the bill is a little lighter, but it's the lighting that isn't so good. But what I wanted you to notice is the scalloping, these mm -hmm. rounded tips on these feathers. This tells us it's, it's a young bird. And so off the coast of Maine, we have young loons, you know, that are year two years old that are wintering as well as adults. Okay, I have a graduate student at the University of Southern Maine, uh, Igor Malenko, who's done quite a bit of work on some of the distributions of loons uh, off the coast. And we were wondering if there's more loons found near river mouths, where there might be higher productivity, more energy, more nutrients, uh, base of the food chain would have more, more energy to support more life. And looking at a bunch of river mouths when he did these uh, surveys, we found probably three to four times more loons uh, at river mouths, mm -hmm. then in subsequently bays or coves without river mouths. Now, one thing that's been neat to find is some flock foraging during the winter time. So because I'm actually looking for this and I've been on boats, 
I see loons acting much more social than we thought. Now, some loons clearly are solitary in the winter. Uh, they don't seem to really defend a territory. But what I've noticed, especially like in the Gulf of Mexico, I have seen more flock foraging as you see here. Now this is, if you're curious, like what time of year is this? This is probably early spring because you have some birds here that are adult birds and others that are molting that you can see here. Uh, what do the birds eat off the coast of Maine? Uh, it's mostly through observational work and uh, there's still more to be done in this area, which is exciting. So whether it's smelt, alewife, capelin, mackerel, pollock, tommy cod, an assortment of uh, intertidal fish species. Uh, so I, I see loons as being a generalist, opportunistic. And in terms of crabs, they eat a fair amount of crabs actually. Mostly the, the predominantly crab is rock crab that we see. They might eat some invasives, green or blue. Jonah crab is a little larger that they may feed on as well. So I just wanted to share with you some data. I just have three slides left. Uh, thank everybody for your time. I was just looking at like crabs per hour because crabs are so large and loons can't swallow them. They bring them to the surface. And so I did time activity budgets of loons down in Louisiana and off the coast of Maine. So you watch loons for an hour, you record everything that you see. And if they bring a crab to the surface, I'm gonna notice it. And what I found is that they actually brought more crabs to the surface off the coast of Maine than they did in Louisiana. And mind you, this is seafood capital of the world. So I was really surprised by this. So we used to think maybe crabs a minor component of their diet. I would almost tend to argue I think crabs are a fairly important part of their diet, depending on where you are geographically. And the other thing was just looking at fish. Uh, obviously they can swallow small fish underwater, larger fish uh, they'll bring to the surface. So in this case, I did see more fish off the coast of Maine than Louisiana. So I was trying to wonder if there's differences in foraging between loons in Louisiana and the coast of Maine. And what I found is that loons in Louisiana are making more dives per hour, so about 21, coast of Maine about 16 dives per hour, and the duration of those dives are about the same. They're like 47 and 46 seconds. So it's not as if loons in Louisiana are taking shorter dives. They're both diving remarkably for about 45 seconds, but the loons in Louisiana are making more dives. So then I was wondering like, do the loons in Louisiana spend more time foraging? And I was plotting some data and you can see about 68% of the time, the loons in Louisiana are busy foraging compared to 53% in Maine. So that suggests to me that the loons off the coast of Maine are, are, are doing quite well, they're well fed. And you might be wondering like, what's the difference behind this? Well, where I was, this study site in Louisiana is near the mouth of the Mississippi, which is known as the Big Muddy. Uh, and the water's really turbid. So the difference in water clarity between these two sites is about ninefold. So um, I'm happy to come back next winter and give more talks on loon ecology, but uh, I will stop there. I think that's all I have and I'll turn it over to Susan. Sure. Well, thank you all for your quick presentations. I, the audience should know that any, any one of these people could have given a full our plus presentation on their particular area of expertise for loons. I know this didn't follow kind of what you might have been expecting, loon natural history. I mean, we tried to mix it in and give some different topic areas. Um, so we appreciate, thank and thank all our um, panelists. And now we move to kind of the more, well, not more exciting, but now we move to the questions and answers. So Brooks, come back to join us. She's been organizing the questions that have come in both before and during the presentation. We will try to get to as many as we can. And again, we'll follow up with email. We're gonna try, um, we have high hopes to try to address most all of your questions in writing if we can't get to them um, during the talk. So I'll pass it over to Brooke. Thank you for all your work to organize questions. You're welcome. Thank you, Susan. So I think the first question here would be for Tracy. Why aren't chicks increasing in line with adults? How can adults increase without chicks increasing? That's funny, we were, Susan and I were yeah. talking about that earlier. Um, yeah, so Susan, did you wanna take this one? Sure, I, this, was, this is the most often, most oft asked question, I think, when people see that graph that, that <laughs> yes. Tracy showed, which is the adults going up. So, 
the way, and so for those of you who don't know, I, I did work for Maine Audubon um, as a loon project director preceding Tracy. So I, I um, showed that graph a lot. Uh, so the, the, there are two possibilities, right? One is that we have more and more loons breeding and they're just not producing as, you know, they're just not producing, they're producing fewer and fewer chicks. Uh, is one possibility. Another possibility is that the number of breeders has potentially stayed the same and that that excess that you see in adults is just non-breeders. So uh, loons don't breed on average until they're between seven and 11, I believe is that, um, I think eight might be the average first age, age of breeding. So there's a big delay in when they breed and the time, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of time spent you know, staying on the ocean in the summer or, you know, wandering around different lakes before they're ready to breed. So there's definitely a possibility that we just have more uh, non-breeders in the population. Uh, so uh, I like to think that that's the answer because that means productivity potentially is holding steady. One of the things that the Loon Project is doing under Tracy's direction now is collecting a little bit more information. The loon count used to be just how many adult, how many adults, how many chicks do you see? Now there's more information about where they are. Are they in pairs? Are they a nesting pair? So the loon count is definitely getting uh, more sophisticated and I think we'll have a better answer to that in the future. So I don't, that doesn't really, we don't really have the answer to that, uh, but um, we hope it's that we have more non-breeders in us population pushing those adults up. Does that sound good to you? Tracy, do you have more to add? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But it, it is worth noting though that the chick population has been either stable or slightly increasing if you look across the trend, so. Yep, yep. yeah, at least it's not going down. So right. Very good news. Great, thank you. This question looks like it could probably be for Mark. Okay. Is there any information on how Chinese mystery snails impact loons, if any? It's a great question. Um, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> basically, basically, I could tell you from handling a lot of loons and x-raying them and opening them up, is there are some lakes where we regularly find loons eating Chinese mystery snails. Um, I could show you some very <laughs> impressive x-rays of some very big snails that these loons are swallowing. Um, I think in general, it's probably good protein. The concern that I've got is that these snails may be carrying exotic parasites. Snails are extremely good at carrying a variety of particularly um, flatworm trematode parasites um, that can get into all different kinds of organisms. And we are finding some odd and unusual parasites in loons in recent years, particularly something called thorny-headed worms, acanthocephalans. And we don't know where they're coming from. We haven't connected the dots, but so I can tell you that the loons have more parasites. They're eating more of the Chinese mystery snails, whether it's cause and effect, I don't know yet. Okay, thank you, Mark. Jim, I think this question could be for you. This is from an email that we had received. What is the farthest a main loon has migrated that you know of? Yeah, I think there's one. Uh, I don't have perfect knowledge of that. So uh, uh, I think uh, folks at Biodiversity Research Institute would probably be the best folks for that. Uh, I do know, I think as far as probably North Carolina is kind of a, and it may have been even further south. So uh, that's probably what I can offer right now. Mark, do you have any other more information on that or? I have a recollection and that's not to say that it's true of, one or more um, loons banded in Maine being found in Florida. I think that Larry Alexander work back Maybe. in the 80s. Okay. Um, had a couple, but that's a vague memory and I don't want to. Yes. We'll, we'll be cautious with our response. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is another question that we had gotten over email and I think it could be answered by any of you on this panel. We've had a lot of people ask about the use of artificial nesting platforms. Some wonder if they help increase nesting productivity, particularly in lakes that have fluctuating lake uh, levels or high levels of eagle predation. If they have a covering, they might be more effective. So people are wondering if they should 
uh, advocate for homemade nesting platforms on their lakes. Would you please offer some of your thoughts about this? <laughs> we probably all have different thoughts about that. <laughs> um, this is a discussion that basically is going on nationwide, both in the US and Canada. Uh, partly because artificial nesting platforms are regulated differently by different states. Some states you have to have a permit to put one in. Other states, anybody who lives on a lake who wants to put in a platform can put one in. I have talked to researchers in Wisconsin, which is an unregulated state, and they've told me about some lakes where basically everybody on the lake has put in multiple platforms. And what it's caused is huge amount of fighting in the loons, they're too dense, they're cr too crowded. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't wanna pretend huge expertise on this, but you know, when I talk to people at BRI, when I talk to Jim, when I talk to Susan, when I talk to Lee Addicts, who I know is in on this phone, this conference call, um, I think the answer is that platforms can be useful in some places at some time, but you need to have somebody who understands loons and who can look at the geography of the lake to try and figure out when it's appropriate, when it would be a good thing or when in fact it might cause more harm than good. And I don't, I don't know that people have put their heads together yet and come up with best practices with, with sort of a list of uh, the best way to do it in different situations, but uh, it's certainly something that a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, I would say uh, I would say the biggest challenge is um, finding out why loons are failing on a lake first. Because if they're failing uh, because of predators, or if they're failing because of of other reasons other than water levels, uh, the the platform isn't going to make a difference. So we you know, we really encourage people to to determine why loons are failing in the first place. And then the other thing to know about platforms is they do, um, you know, there's a couple of papers out, they do increase productivity, but um, it does take, um, on average, I believe it's three platforms to, you know, for every three platforms that are placed, one gets used. So, uh, you know, you have to move it around, you have to be patient, you have to wait, it could take a couple years, they could never use it, you know, yeah. they, if they don't like it, they'll never use it. So. There's no guarantee that it works, and but in the right place, especially when you know that your uh, that a, a nest on a lake that you, you know your lake is consistently being flooded out. That's when that's really the the to me the sign for that you're going to have the most success with a platform. Yeah, the other the other point to build on Susan's comments there too is I think that in some cases, you know, you put the loons out on a platform and they're very visible they can increase the amount of human disturbance to the area because everybody wants to come over and check out the loons and get a picture and things like that. They can also, in some situations, make the birds more vulnerable to predators, uh, particular aerial predators like bald eagles. Um, and so again, you got to know the particular location. And I think that's one of those things where getting a consult, having a loon expert to come in and talk to you about your particular situation is probably what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maine Audubon, we, what we've talked about is some guidelines for when platforms might be appropriate and uh, we we're saying if loons have failed in nesting for at least three years and especially on lakes that have fluctuating yeah. levels, um, but also to keep in mind that these take a lot of maintenance. So <laughs> it's that you can just yeah. put out and leave. So if you, you don't have enough of a force to be able to keep it going to keep it maintained then it's probably better to stick with natural nesting yeah we should note that there's there is a group sort of a nationwide group at this point i think that um, john cooley at the loon preservation mm -hmm. committee in new hampshire is probably going to chair that but there's a group of people around the country with the pole shucks in washington state and kathy jones in ontario and who are going to get together as sort of a series of video conferences mm -hmm. to try and put everybody's ideas together and come up with some general recommendations. Yeah, and Mark, you had that email string too that had everyone's suggestions on raft designs and at work. It, oh, it's only just starting, Casey. There'll yeah. be a few emails in the next week or two. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, so if that could ever be made available to people interested. Yeah. Great, right. thank you. This, oh, Susan, were you going to say something? No, no, okay. go on, go for it. Um, this next question looks like it's for Tracy. How does a lake <laughs> get started with a loon count program? Ah, okay, fantastic. All you have to do is either email, I guess I could try to put my screen back up, e email Maine Audubon. Uh, or give us a call and then we would hook you up with a regional coordinator so that Maine is divided up into various regions and then they would um, give you the instructions for how to do the loon count, uh, get you a loon data form and coordinate which area of a lake, if you're on a lake that has more than one survey area, where you'd be counting. Um, and then you would head out on July 18th this year at between starting at 7 a.m. ending at 7 30 and um, and then pass in your loon count form to um, it to first to your regional coordinator and then it'll make its way to Maine Audubon. Um, we also have an online portal now where you can enter data so but often lake associations will sort of take the lead on some of these and, and then help get the word out to various loon counters so um, we have Mark participates on Todd so maybe you can say a little bit about the experience there too, Mark. Well, I, I just, it's a good chance to put in a, a plug for lake associations in general. I mean, I've been active in the one on Toddy Pond, but I think that if your lake doesn't have a lake association, anything you can do to encourage the formation of one, um, partly you identify people who share your interests on the lake and who are interested in protecting all the resources of the lake. Um, protecting the loons, protecting the water quality and clarity, keeping out exotic invasive invertebrates like, you know, Chinese mystery snails, but also exotic mm -hmm. plants um, that might be invading. Um, and so I think lake associations can serve a number of just wonderful um, um, services to help preserve the water quality for, for everything that we value in Maine and around the country. Okay, I think we have time. Oh, please for join more. us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's great. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one more before five o'clock. Jim, how do loons time ice out so perfectly when they return to the lakes each spring? Hey, I wish I knew that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I, think, I think that might just remain a mystery. Uh, I think it's a great question. There's a telepathic communication going on. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get it. Uh, but I think we can marvel at how remarkable it is. Uh, it, it really is astonishing. Uh, with those of us who, you know, who have seen the opportunity, that literally, you know, as soon as the ice is out, it's like they're there. You know, whether in, you're in Minnesota, you're Saskatchewan, of course, uh, here in Maine, uh, it is really extraordinary how quick they can get back. Uh, I will add to that, males seem to come back sooner before females, you know, usually like a day or more. Uh, but typically about a day. But as you go further up, like up in Saskatchewan, where these are long distance migrants, uh, oftentimes males and females might come back a little closer together. So that, and it's going to depend on the year, uh, uh, how much, uh, you know, what, how warm it's been. Uh, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't have a great answer to that. I do think it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Well, I don't, I don't know if I should burst your bubble or not, Jan. Go for but it. Well, so what I've read, and, and I, but I don't have like uh, primary sources, but I've read they sort of make scouting trips that they're following ice out as it goes north and that loons are overhead, they're flying to where the ice is and then they're turning back around and resting. Have you ever, have you yeah, read I've, that? Yeah, I've read that as well. And there's probably some validity to it for sure. Yeah. You know, but uh, I think there's still, there's still probably a little mystery, but that makes, uh, Solid sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good something, something for somebody to study. <laughs> so it is actually just about five o'clock, it's 4.59. I'm happy to continue to ask questions or what do you think, Susan, how should we proceed? Um, well, let me, uh, why don't I, I'll share my screen and just, I do have a wrap up. Um, I do have my wrap up that I showed at the beginning, but I'll show it now. Um, a wrap up screen. I just want people to, first of all, I, I'll just, I, I can definitely stay on for a little bit. I think we can do a couple more questions for anybody who wants to stay on. Um, I'll just do, oops, 
I have some other slides mm -hmm. there, but anyway, just, um, just, I want to make a plug for next week. We're talking about, uh, it's a webinar about broadening your lake association audience. It can go, you don't have to be a lake association. Uh, Jeremy Clucci from the Nature Conservancy will be doing a great presentation with sort of tricks. He's a great uh, communications director and he'll have a lot to say. So if you're in any organization or any organization looking to uh, improve your communication techniques, come back next week. Uh, if you like what you heard, like I said, we'd love to have you uh, become a member and um, join us. And the, uh, you can join from our website, mainlakesociety.org. Uh, and then again, I mentioned before the post webinar, the short five question evaluation will be, um, will pop up when you, when you leave. So I know people are trickling off the webinar, but why don't we just do like two more questions while we've got people here. And Jim, I know if you need to go, that's fine too. Um, mm -hmm. I know, but I'm happy to take a couple more questions. Okay, great. So uh, let's see. I think actually, Susan, this is a good one for you. It seems that we now have constant fireworks on the weekends at Swan Lake. Do mm. we know if the noise and disturbance have any impact on loons? Yeah, that's a great question. Anecdotally, we know it does because we know um, we, we hear them call, we hear them make distress calls when the fireworks go off. We know we have more fireworks now because of the consumer fireworks law from a few years ago. <coughs> Pardon me, so we know we have more fireworks. We know anecdotally that, the, that there's more calls and more distress, but we have no, uh, there's no documentation that we know of, um, and there's no documentation of what it actually does. So there's lots of people out there thinking about that. How can we document it? How can we, how can we um, study it in a scientific way to give some really solid evidence? Uh, there was just a, uh, there was a bill last, this last session in the legislature, uh, LD 1942, that would have uh, prohibited fireworks in the shoreland zone. It got, it was defeated. Well, it was, it passed, but it was really amended so that it, uh, it, what it does is it will, uh, it, it forces the uh, retailers, the fireworks retailers to give out information when they sell fireworks. They're supposed to give out information about the shoreland zone and the impacts of fireworks in the shoreland zone. Now, I don't know who's writing that information or what it's going to say, but we're, we're following that really closely to see what they're going to say because there's definitely a lot of people interested in um, in fireworks in the shoreline zone, not only impacts on loons and on loon behavior, but also water quality. You know, the fireworks are, we know they're full of all kinds of um, nasty chemicals that we don't want in our lakes. Uh, there's a lot of just there's the paper and then there's the chemicals inside. So there's definitely interest. There's definitely concern. I don't have a solid um, answer, but there's a lot to, still a lot to be done. Okay, great, thank you. Mark, this question might be for you. This, uh, someone emailed us for, or texted us from East Pond, but they were very interested in how the loon population might be affected by alum treatments. Do we know anything about East Pond or any other ponds? Hmm. Um, short answer is no. <laughs> um, I believe I've been in touch with um, Danielle Doria at Inland Fisheries and Wildlife about this. This was a pond that I think had alum applied last year because of al al algal bloom. <clears throat> and there was a loon found dead on the pond shortly thereafter. Um, and I did send the state agency a whole bunch of literature on aluminum toxicity and things of that nature. And they were gonna look into getting some of the bird's tissues tested. Um, and I don't know what's happened from that. Um, in general, if alum is used in you know, appropriate concentrations, it's not supposed to have much acute toxicity. Um, but, Again, it hasn't been studied in loons. It hasn't been studied in a lot of different species. Um, and it, it, like many metals, it can have some really nasty effects. So uh, I don't know the answer in that, in that situation, but there has been a, con a conversation with inland fisheries and wildlife about it. Okay, thank you. Tracy, yeah, there are... Oh, go ahead, this, Susan. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, why don't we make this our last question? We'll wrap up. Okay, well, there were a couple of questions this, for Tracy. 
about why the loom count is only a half hour. That seems a little <laughs> short. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be, I mean, Susan might be able to answer the history of this a little bit more, but um, it's to make sure that you're counting the same loon. So if you make it much longer, then you're going to have loons moving into different survey areas and possibly duplicating your counts. So by keeping it short, we get a quick snapshot of loons in one place and um, that allows us to get a better sense for deriving the population estimate. Would you say the same thing, Susan? Yep. yep. That's okay. about it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks to all our panelists. Thanks to Brooke. Thanks for thanks to Drew, who is off video, but has been uh, keeping us all going with the technical side of things. Thanks you all for attending. Uh, we appreciate your time spent with us on this beautiful afternoon, and we hope we see you in a future webinar. Thanks very much. Thank Take you, care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.